Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss modern metadata strategies. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people attending this session, we will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. It's always good to join these. Um, and as Shannon mentioned, this is part of a yearly uh, series. We have this new this year, the new data architecture strategies. If you missed January or February, they are all on demand, and that's always one of the favorite questions. Um, will the slides be available for this presentation? Yes, and it will actually be recorded if you want to hear all this lovely topic again. Um, and then you'll see there's a lineup for the rest of the year and a lot of hot topics around data architecture from graph databases to data lakes to MDM, et cetera. So jumping in just for today, today's topic is one of my favorites, which is metadata. Um, and we'll talk a lot about this during the presentation, but metadata is hotter than ever, which is music to the, our ears, the folks that are interested in metadata. And, and what I find interesting about that, that a lot of the interest is really coming from business drivers, that people are trying to get better value from data. And as we know, as soon as you try to get value from data, you need metadata. And we'll talk around that. So that's, I like to sort of talk about the carrot and the stick. That's the carrot. You know, the more value we want to get from data, we need to understand that through metadata. There's also the stick. Uh, things like industry regulations and GDPR might be top of a lot of folks' minds coming up soon. That's sort of, we absolutely need to have this or we'll get in trouble, right? So never is fun to do the second, but often I've worked with several companies that are doing metadata for regulation and actually see a lot of business benefit from it as a side effect. So it's a uh, positive trend. The other thing um, that I uh, love to wax poetic about is just how fun it is to be in data now because there is so much new technology coming so quickly and in, in innovation in the industry. But the challenge of that is how do we track metadata about some of these new technologies? And we'll talk about is there a way we can use these two new technologies to track metadata, so sort of meta meta innovation. <laughs> so we'll talk about all of those today, but sort of where a lot of folks start when we talk about metadata is what is metadata, right? And I, I think by now a lot of folks know. I like to keep it simple. Metadata is a complicated enough word, but it's really data in context, right? It's not just a number, a number has meaning. Sort of the, the Zachman framework, if you will, for metadata is that another way to think about this is that metadata is really that who, what, where, why, when, and how of data. And we won't go through each cell in this spreadsheet, but you get the idea of who created it, who's the data steward if you're doing data governance, who's using it, who, quote, owns it, who's regulating or auditing. You know, the what, I think, I think, is what a lot of folks think of when they think of metadata. What's the business definition? What's the technical definition? But, you know, think beyond that. Are there security level, privacy requirements, et cetera? Uh, where, when we think of lineage, you know, where's this data stored? Where did it come from? But also things like backup and recovery. Or, you know, especially when we think of things like GDPR, are there regional differences or privacy rules around that, that, that police this data? Why? <laughs> Sometimes you might wonder, right? Why are we storing this data anyway? Um, but that's a big part um, when we talk about governance and data quality fit for purpose uh, information. What, what, what is this data meant to be used for? Uh, don't use it incorrectly. When? When was it created? When was it last updated? Is it the freshest version? Um, and then the how. I guess a lot of folks, I think, when we think of metadata, it's often the what, you know, how is it defined, and then the how. How is it formatted? How many databases? All that sort of thing. So it really is that full spectrum of what is the context around my information. 
um, if you've been on my presentations before, you'll, you'll be familiar with this framework, but we get a lot of positive feedback of, about it. The thing about metadata management, you'll see sort of here in the, in the circle box, um, it, it can be seen as its own thing, but really it supports everything in this box. You can't do governance without having metadata management. You can't really have a, a realistic business strategy and take action on data if you don't know what it means. You certainly can't integrate or even understand data if you don't know its format and its source and where it came from. Try to build a data warehouse without any metric definitions, you'll have trouble, right? So I would love to have metadata just be, you know, a check in the box for all of these things. But as we'll talk about today, metadata is a, a thing in and of itself. You need to manage it and have a certain strategy around that. So we'll talk through that today. Um, as I've already mentioned, and we'll keep mentioning because I love to hear it, um, metadata is hotter than ever. So I've been doing metadata before metadata was cool. Well, metadata, oh, before people realized metadata was cool. Um, and, and it's just interest is growing with the interest in data. And so we'll refer to several surveys, um, research papers we've done with Dataversity in the past few years, um, and metadata is always top of mind. So this is a statistic I like, uh, that over 80% of people said metadata is not only as important as the past, but even more important than it has been with this growing interest in data. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a question. Um, we have links to how you can download the papers we'll reference in the back, um, and, and Shannon will follow up with that as well. Um, interesting in, in the paper uh, is sort of why it's interesting. So some of us, like nerds like me, just think it's interesting in its own right. Um, but really, um, why is it growing? And this is an interesting statistic. It was not only the 2016 survey, but also the 2017 survey. So you can kind of see the growth. It's, you know, for the data statisticians, they weren't necessarily the same people answering each question. So it's, take that as the grain of salt. But um, you'll see that certain things just didn't um, change. That data governance, data quality, data warehousing, master data management, as I mentioned, you can't do any of those without metadata, especially governance now that it's growing. You just, that's the lineage, the, the definitions is key to that. 2017 saw a growth in a few things. Regulation, which you could say is tied to governance. Things like I mentioned, GDPR or Basel II, you know, any of the, the industry regulations you might have. Um, as well as master data management, which um, I found interesting. I know in our practice we're getting a lot of uh, interest in that. But, you know, I keep going back to this slide. <laughs> Why do I use it? To me, it's almost my checklist. And I'll go into a client, and they, they'd like governance, but you can't do governance without master data. You can't do master data without metadata. You can't do that without an integration. <laughs> really, almost everything has often a piece of a lot of these. So there is just such a close interrelationship. I'm not surprised by seeing that, kind of getting that single view of customer, single view of you know, product, et cetera. So driving a little, you know, this is sort of technical in terms of the, the main use cases people are seeing. I always like to tell stories, as you know, it's just sort of, you know, what, what does this mean? You know, this is uh, all of the examples in this presentation sort of resemble something in real life, but then obfuscated to protect the innocent. Um, but this came from a client we'd worked with, uh, financial, an international retail chain, and they were trying to compare its fourth quarter sales. So in North America, you often see a sort of spike in sales around the November, December time frame. Uh, there's a lot of holiday, end of year sales, that kind of thing. But they just acquired a subsidiary in Latin America, um, and their sales were particularly low around that. And they're in North America, the similar culture to you know Europe and North America. So they were wondering, you know, what's wrong? Do we have to increase marketing? Is this just maybe the wrong market? Maybe Latin America doesn't like our, should we start closing stores? And then they went through and they said, well, actually, uh, what, what is in a name, right? So when they, Latin America was using a fiscal year of June to June, everyone else was using a calendar year. So something as simple as what do we mean by a year? <laughs> what do we mean by a quarter? What do we mean by a, you know? And we'll go through these examples throughout the presentation. And this is where, and, until it clicks, I remember I've told this story before when I was early on in the industry, and I'd be at something like an Enterprise Data World Conference, and they'd say, you know, trying to get that single view of customer, ha, ha, ha. And, and I just sort of looked around, how hard is that? A customer is a customer. And, and I know you're probably rolling your eyes at me because, you know, do one project in data, you'll understand the subtleties of what do we mean by all these. And that's where we can sometimes sound like a crazy nerd um, <laughs> when we overdo it until people clicks with them. What do you mean by a year? You know, you can think you're crazy. What is this person? Have they not lived? You know, of course I know what a year is, but you may not. And that is the whole thing of metadata. What do I mean by? And really getting that clarification. So this example, it wasn't just um, the, the how do we define core terms. That's a 
key part of metadata. But it also gets back to data lineage, which is a huge part of things like GDPR or any just understanding of business of where did a term come from. That's the audit and traceability. So you know, it could be that you know total sales per customer this quarter are 1.5 million. That's great. How did you calculate that? Um, so good news, especially when we're talking about modern metadata strategies, this, this particular use case has been around for years now, and a lot of vendors have been doing this for years, um, but you can get that lineage in an automated way. So there's metadata repositories, a lot of other you know, data modeling tools and collaboration tools now have things called scanners or interfaces or whatever they pretend to use. Um, that really can automate a lot of this and get that lineage because if, if you've built one of these, you'll know that there's sort of a ETL process that can get from your source to your target. Your data modeling tool has built in metadata. So a lot of these tools, they have metadata about your metadata, <laughs> just to keep using meta. Um, so this can be, I don't want to say relatively easy because as you know, getting the matching right, but this has been done for a while and this can be automated. It's getting better and we'll talk about that. Um, but this is a, your fairly almost classic uh, lineage from source to target. Do you need all of this every time? Maybe not. You might not need to have uh, the full detailed lineage. At a minimum, you should know how we're calculating total sales. I think the auditors might want to know that and what the metadata is. Um, so moving ahead, another part of the lineage is this idea of impact analysis. Um, so think of any software development. And this came from, again, protected innocent example that I've worked with. Something as simple, you're developing software and I want to change the name of the software. I want to change the brand. Our company was acquired and now we have a new name for a company. Where is this affected? This software that's written that says name of company, there's orders that went out to customers with the name of the company. Wouldn't it be nice just to say where is this used and change it once and have it cascade? Um, one would think, um, but as anyone who's done this knows that that lineage doesn't always exist. So having tools that can help you automate that and see that impact of change, not only does that help you do it faster, but that reduces risk. You know, this, this is a fairly innocuous, amp well, maybe not innocuous, your brand, that's actually your face of the company, but it could be anything. It could be customer name, I've changed the name, how is that cascade through the system, I'm changing anything. I worked with a big retail company um, a few months ago, again, name protected for the innocent, um, but somebody innocently changed the name of the customer uh, customer identifier from 12 to 10 characters and broke the system and orders weren't going out and it was a major emer emergency. So when I was young, <laughs> and my, I used to joke, uh, there's a metadata emergency I have to get to work for. But we really do. Um, so there was a lot of things behind that, governance, change management. But had that person said, what happens when I change the name of our product code, these things are going to break. That's <laughs> pretty important to running the business. So metadata does matter. The other thing uh, we hear a lot in the industry is big data, right, and big data analytics. And I, I'm confident now and pleased to see that the, the fallacy of you don't need metadata for big data has gone away. It isn't just magically put it in a lake and, and sort of munge it together and, and great insights come out. Um, I would say almost more so with big data analytics, you need to have the metadata around it. So here's an example. This actually came from one of the clients we worked with. Uh, doing sort of energy meter reading and smart meters that I've talked about on previous webinars. Um, so it could just say our analysis showed that energy use with smart meters increases by, you know, 5% for each decrease in temperature. So the colder it gets, um, then, then the more energy you use. But with smart meters, you can be more efficient, right? Well, there's a lot of questions about that. How did you get that analysis? Did you use it by household, by individual? How do you get household? Is it by your residence? Is it by relationships with other people? When were these readings taken? What was the source of the weather, weather data? Was it Celsius or Fahrenheit? You know, all of, the, all of these questions are relevant to getting the answer to that question right. And, and so unless you have that, you can have really embarrassing sort of results. So um, an interesting uh, statistics, and I'll have a lot more in this presentation, of one of the biggest impediments to data lakes, according to uh, actually uh, Boulder area, Colorado um, research advisor, radiant advisors, um, was that's one of the biggest impediments to success of a data lake is not having commonly understood shared metadata and data definitions. So you can have these great numbers that came out through data science and statistics, but unless you know the context of that and the meaning of it, it's not going to be valuable at all. So there's two types of, meta, well, many types of metadata, but the two main categories 
or business metadata and technical metadata, and that should be obvious, but here's some examples. You know, business metadata, what do we mean by a customer? A customer is a person or an organization, B2B and B2C. They purchase a product or a service. You know, there's a lot of context around something as easy as a definition. Um, or data stewardship, privacy level, acronyms, all of that stuff that kind of makes business sense is your business metadata. The technical metadata is, you know, your almost your data dictionary type. Uh, what's this column structure? What's the data type and length? Um, are there nullability rules? Uh, how is data moved? What server is it on? All that sort of stuff. And both are important if you really want to understand the context of your data. So delving a little bit more into business metadata, um, and why do we start with business metadata? Because I think everything with data should relate back to the business, but also it's sort of proven by the numbers. So in this data diversity survey, um, I found it was interesting. 80% of the users of metadata are from the business. So I just thought that was interesting, let it sink in. I mean, that's sort of obvious that that's really what helps the that communication going. So something like how does total sales calculated? They want to know that. And I found from my experience in consulting, I often find the business users sort of get that more than IT does. And, and you know, I, I'll claim to be a techie IT person, but I think we're also our worst enemy. Really, do I have to document what I did? Well, yeah, so <laughs> people know. It's, it's not the fluff. It's actually the meat of what you're doing, the context, try to sell what you're doing by having people understand. Um, one of my favorite quotes from a business user, we were sort of explaining, you know, metadata and lineage and why we need this. We were actually trying to explain sort of this picture, that, you know, why we need a warehouse and all the lineage and we can calculate total sales and what it means. And she said, um, you mean you're not already doing that? <laughs> pretty scary. We just sort of assumed you did know where the data was and what it means, right? So, you know, to our credit in, in, in the tech world, it's not always that easy to just magically have things documented, but, you know, documentation is as important as the code you're writing or the database you're building. It's just that's how people know how to use that, and I think the business gets it, um, and we just have to support that. So, you know, an example of that that hit home, and I, I used this example last year in one of the BI presentations I did, you know, self-serve is, is huge, there's open data sets, there's amazingly cool data visualization tools out there. You know, this is the time in the world for data nerds to just be able to play around and have fun. But as you know, data is only as good as the metadata. So this is an example I was actually trying to show the power of open data and some of these visualization tools, and there was a data set out there from one of the UK agencies um, that was road safety by vehicle make and model. And I thought, that'd be fun. Let's see, is it the Porsches that, that are getting into more accidents compared to the Volkswagens, right? Um, but I couldn't ever get there because there was no metadata. So I did some really neat visualizations. I know that F3 is just amazing um, compared to, you know, F10 that's sort of weak. And, and F120169, I have no idea what this data means. I know there's something really interesting. It's almost teasing you because you can see that there's some patterns. We have no idea what that means. And just basic, I can sort of assume that F2 is probably a year, 2015, but it's sort of shown as a 2,001. Yeah, it's just there's no metadata. So this awesome visualization tools and amazingly open data that somebody spent a lot of time collecting is completely wasted because there's no context, right? So. Um, you know, that that is just kind of, I thought, was an interesting way to show that example. Um, but especially in this idea of the rise of self-service BI and analytics and data prep, more and more folks are going to that self-service model, which is a, a great thing because more people are looking at the data and they want to play around with it themselves. So a good, good Gartner um, study, actually, they predict by 2020, over half of folks will probably be doing some self-service data prep with data integration and reporting. But I thought it was interesting that they called out, too, that it's curated metadata is needed, right? So uh, they predict by 2019, um, organizations that provide agile, curated, that emphasis mine, um, internal and external data sets will re realize twice the benefits of those that don't. And I think the key is that, yeah, agile, get it out there, but don't just get it out there and have, no one has any idea. This example might have been really fast to get that vehicle data out there, but <laughs> completely useless until I know what it means. So I just found that, I mean, self-service is great. Self-service is great with nice curated data sets. And, and that is sort of, sh again, should be obvious, but often in the rush to get things out fast, we, we skip the most important thing, which is the metadata. Um, so my f famous, you know, quote is avoided the I just know. And again, you're building this, you know, something like part number. 
really, I have to make a definition for a part number. A part number is the number of a part. You know, please don't roll your eyes and do definitions like that because stop for a second and think, is there context around that? Could something be like, oh, you know, this is a guy that's been with the company for 20 years that used to be called component number. Really, thank you, uh, that someone who's building a script would love to have known that. Or part number is alphanumeric. Um, the first two fields mean the customer region. And please don't do that and, and build intelligent keys that way. Um, but there's often so much more information that could be put in a definition that would be critical to some of the analysis. So please do share that out. Put it in a glossary or a metadata repository or a data model or some of the new collaboration tools or all of the above um, because that's really the meat. Take that extra time uh, to do that. Um, because in this new world of Agile and uh, data science and self-service BI and data lakes, metadata matters even more than ever. So, um, you know, sort of the, the irony of it is, and I, you know, we've all heard the statistic that data science this is the sexiest job of the 21st century and, and all of that, right? So these folks that got these fancy degrees and have all this great information are all excited to go be a data scientist and they spend about 80% of their day just trying to do things like reformat region codes or find the metadata or get, get things into a common format, right? And so here's another quote, you know, data scientists spend 50 to 90% of their time cleaning and reformatting data to make it fit for purpose, right? So again, magic doesn't happen. Numbers are numbers, data is data. It's the data quality context structure, i.e. metadata, data models, glossaries, lineage, all of that stuff is what makes data science sing. So lots of waste, wasting that person's time, wasting their energy, this person that would love to be doing awesome an an analytics and she kind of wants to shoot herself because she just wants to get some work done, not this other stuff. Um, so when things are done right, here's the happier self-service user um, because there's metadata. And, and we'll talk more about this. I, I think in a lot of ways there's kind of this dichotomy to I don't want to say, but traditional or old school things like master data and data warehouses and glossaries and data models and metadata repositories. And I think there's a fallacy, and I will strongly say that's a fallacy, that you don't need that anymore. Of course you need that. If I have, you know, I'm reporting financial metrics to the street and that's audited, I need to have closely regulated metadata. I need published documentation, I need lineage, I need standards. If I have something like product codes in my company, they had better be standardized and published. And I think the self-service user would be the first one to say that. Great, there is a standardized data set. I would love to use that. Do I want to build it? Maybe not. That's why data architects have a great place in this world. <laughs> folks like me who actually enjoy doing that kind of stuff. Um, but publish that out. Let makes for sure folks that are, want to use that. But there's another kind of metadata, which is kind of, I guess, crowdsourcing way. And that's also metadata. Um, but in a way, this is the agility and the um, making people's lives interesting that, you know, if I'm building a data warehouse and I want my master data, I'd love to use them, sort of here on the left. I can also use that for my own self-service data prep and analysis. But there's certain things I'm building that is metadata about. What, um, what model, the analytical model did I use? What data set did I use? Hey, I tried this cool query and that really worked well. That's more that crowdsourcing. I want to see what other people have done. Oh my gosh, somebody else already built the model. I could use that. Maybe I'll go talk to Joe who built this model, right? So it's sort of the, one of the ways I like to look at it is kind of the encyclopedia versus the Wikipedia and, and both are good, right? So I was one of the skeptics when Wikipedia came out. Are you serious? People are just kind of put stuff out there. That's why we have people who write encyclopedias. Um, but I use it all the time. You know, you, take, you understand where it's coming from, but it's that wisdom of the crowd, that eventual consistency, it's being dynamic. There's still a place for an encyclopedia. It's going to take longer. There's probably a few vetting it. Um, you know, there can be problems with that approach too, because are you getting the right um, information from everybody? So I think there's a mix, right? So if there's a standardized enterprise data set, these are the validated product codes we're using please publish them. There should be some sort of feedback. People can say, actually, that's not right, and let's give some feedback into that. But the Wikipedia is more really for that self-service data prep analytics. Hey, I found this cool query. Hey, look at this data set. Or uh, some of the tools out there can actually do usage metrics. Well, I know this is the approved data set, but 90% of the people are using this. So maybe this is the right def quote right definition of total sales that's actually being used or we put out a, a data set and no one's using it. Why not? Let's evaluate. So, 
know, the nice thing is that both, again, are valid. It's finding that right balance. So don't do the wrong approach for each. Don't just loosey-goosey put out, you know, core uh, master data without it being properly governed um, with proper lineage and proper committee voting and all of that. You still need that. Um, but also don't over-govern things like people are doing exploratory analytics. They work well together, just do the right approach for each. Um, and then that really, I think, when we're talking about modern metadata strategies, it is that you have the best of both worlds, right? I still use an encyclopedia. I'm glad people can do scientific research and vet things out for years and then tell me the answer, right? But there's also someone in their backyard that really knows how to put up a swing that I bought. I don't know. I just made that up, right? And that's sort of the crowdsourcing. I'm glad they can just do a video and show me, right? So both are valid. That Neither one goes away. It's just using the right approach for the right method. The other thing, really, that I like about metadata, um, and I, uh, this is an acronym, FTLB. I made it up. Faster time to light bulb, right? How do we make faster decisions? And of course, there's some metadata around this. It doesn't mean foot-pound energy management unit, right? So unless you knew that, you didn't have metadata, you wouldn't have known what I said. Um, but I have seen this over and over and over in organizations. Um, you know, folks love to say crazy things like, oh, we don't need data models anymore. It's all big data, or we don't need um, metadata. Well, of course, even more so with the volumes of information we have in the data lakes. So I'm a big fan of the conceptual data model or the business level data model because I've seen it over and over, these light bulbs go off. Even just a high level conceptual model that again, think of that guy in the picture, gosh, I have to document this, we just know. Well, of course we have staff and support reps and engineers and customers and products. Do we really have to build a model to show that? Yes, you do. Um, because you start to see, for example, you spell it out this way in a nice clear way because there is so much complexity behind this. Making it simple is valuable. And you start to see the light bulb. Wow, we have support reps that are actually talking with customers or ch online chatting, and there's these support logs. Wouldn't it be great if we could pass that back to engineering and they could help feed that back into product design? Yeah, I never really saw that till it was so clearly spelled out in something like a data model. Or, wow, this is interesting. When we look at this, we have this loyalty program, which are the customers that are most excited about our product, and in the data bases, there's no link between anything. We don't know which of our customers who bought a product from our invoices are actually part of the loyalty program. Huh. Maybe we should know. We don't actually have our loyalty program linked to product. So maybe we know what customer it is. Maybe we can fix that line. But wouldn't it be great if we knew which products of ours they bought and which ones they like and can we feed that back into engineering, right? So this is like your whiteboard brainstorming through metadata and through things like data models. And yes, behind this, might be um, a data lake, it might be a relational database, it might be Internet of Things streaming data from your product, it could be S3 buckets on Amazon, right? It doesn't mean that you don't have the coolest new tech. It means you're understanding what it means um, and how you can better use it. So metadata does matter, um, not only what we mean by acronyms, but really thinking strategically around your data, and you can't do that without metadata. So. That is why it matters. It isn't just a documentation exercise. It really is helping you make better data-driven decisions. So that was sort of the business side of the equation and why we need it. Um, but the technical part is equally as important and um, equally as challenging and exciting, actually. So this is, again, from the, um, the one of the research papers of what are people using now in terms of metadata for technical platforms and what is being used in the future, right? So now, um, I don't, didn't find too many surprises in that. So a lot of what we discussed in almost that classic picture, I'll keep going back to it because it just sort of resonates with, I think, with a lot of people. You know, it's this picture. It's BI tools, it's data warehousing, it's meta, uh, data models, it's glossaries, right? Um, now I have to jump back to my own picture. So that uh, ETL tools, um, that has sort of been the classic metadata story for many years. That doesn't go away. When you look at the future um, state, you'll see that all those things are still important, but what I found interesting is now like, everything's important. <laughs> all those lines just get bigger and more volume. Um, so that continues, but you'll see some other data source platforms and things like big data, machine learning and AI, semantic technologies, NoSQL. I found this interesting. We'll talk about this legacy platforms, right? So when you say, what are people using today? Yeah, we have some legacy things like COBOL and JCL.
that's only going to increase in the future. My thought on that is that that guy in the picture, why do I have to document my code? Well, someday you're going to retire and no one's going to have any idea what that means. And no one's going to have any idea what even COBOL is at some point. Um, so you need metadata to really understand that because that's still in, they're still running. There's big old mainframes running things quite well um, that aren't going to go away in the near term and we need to integrate that with other systems. So things like social media, media, video files, vi pictures, all of that has core metadata that tells a story about your organization and integrating that can be a huge challenge. So that is the other side, not just from the um, technical side, but from the not just from the business side, but from the technical side as well. So, some of you might think, could she have talked any faster and she's going to speed up? Yes. Yes, it can happen. No. Um, I, I'm one of the few nerds that actually like would spend the time, and I found this super interesting. Like, What, what does that mean? What is social media metadata? What is a, a, a picture metadata? And I've actually gone through and done some examples, and I'm I am not going to spend a lot of time on each slide. I just will tell you that now. We're just going to zip through them as an example. And then if you're interested, as I said, Shannon will be sending out the slides. There's enough on that slide that you can kind of digest. I just wanted to point out, yes, here's some thoughts and examples of what, what, what would COBOL metadata be, right? So in case you run into this and you're, you're bored some night and want to look it up, um, this will just be a reference for you. So in the zipping through, COBOL copybook metadata, yes, I know the title is Modern Metadata Strategies, but they are still around, right, and it's only going to grow. So think of that as almost your data dictionary, it's something like a COBOL copybook. It tells you the structure of that data. So if you need to go back and look at uh, an old system, something like a COBOL copybook can tell you how, what it means, first name, last name, date of birth. Ah, oh, got it. Thank you, metadata. You've made my life easier. Next in the laundry list. Big data platform, ah, oh, this could be a whole webinar, but we're gonna spend a second on it. So just when you think of it, a big data, is like a Hadoop, that's a file system platform, something like HDFS. So when you get the pure metadata from that, you're going to get the metadata from the file system, almost your directory structure, right? You can also get how that data was ingested and put on there, some business, what does this file mean? Can we tag the file? I think what a lot of people mean when they mean big data, big data metadata is the stuff on the platform, right? So there's no structure there unless you put it there. So if you have something like a hive, it's going to look more like a, you know, hive structure is going to look more like a relational database, but you could be putting video files out, you could be putting anything. So when people say big data, that could mean so many things. So at its core, you're going to get the file structure or you can get the metadata about those things on the platform, right? Um, NoSQL, again, that could be a whole webinar. And what do you mean by NoSQL? That's just a huge swath of things, right? So again, it depends on what platform. For no key value databases, they can be amazing, they can be fast, they can do a lot of great things. Metadata is not one of their strengths. You really kind of have keys and values. Um, and often it's the application code that's adding that metadata. It's not like a relational database that one of the nice things about relational, it does have that sort of structure like your COBOL copybook they can give you the structure of that. Um, some NoSQL databases can. Think of a document database, uh, like a MongoDB. They, they do sort of have much better metadata in that sense. Some modeling tools support that. Um, and you can see they kind of have different kind of your tags, that there's a country called China, and then there's different things. You could have a, um, an artifact, you can have a book, et cetera, et cetera. So some NoSQL does have metadata, some aren't as strong. Uh, image metadata, uh, this is actually where some folks were talking about EDW uh, that's coming up next month. This is a picture from it, gorgeous venue. Um, I'll take a little extra time to tell a story. Uh, I was at a party, I do get out sometimes, um, and a friend of mine who was a, a photographer was talking about metadata. And I practically ran across the room and accosted him like, did you say metadata? And she's like, uh, I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? She's like, well, you know, the tags and stuff that people can find your photos online and you know what it means. I'm like, yes, yes, and why do you use the term metadata? And at this point, she's kind of frightened and is like, yeah, I think I need to go get a drink. She's like, because that's the term they call it. I don't know. Leave me alone. But, I, you know, we tend to think that metadata is a, our data warehousing type world. People use metadata all over for, this is an actual picture I took. I'm a terrible photographer. All the settings, and you might love this photo. How do I recreate Donna's artisticness, right? 
Um, well, here's what she did. She had an Apple iPhone. These were the settings. You can add your own tags so that if someone wanted to search for EDW pictures in San Diego and Google, they can find them. Or I have a copyright. This is such a great picture. I've copywritten his license for it. Don't use it. All right. So lots of metadata about something like a picture. Um, social media. Gosh, if you want to nerd out, all of the, the metadata you can get from a tweet, pretty darn interesting. Who, who tweeted where they were, what device they used, et cetera, et cetera. Sort of interesting, creepy, however you want to look at it. But yeah, there's a lot of metadata in social media that you can mine and integrate into your systems. Um, this one, metadata for machine learning, right? I mean, that's fascinating now, right? So what I find interesting there is that's not only the data that was used, but what algorithm are we using? There's a lot of controversy in media now of is there bias in algorithms? Can we publish what algorithm is being used to make a decision about a population or a, a you know, marketing campaign or whatever, right? So there it's not only the, med the data that has metadata around it, but the algorithms themselves. Um, so again, we're zipping through all of these could be a webinar of, of themselves. Semantic Web was one that came up. You know, think of our RDF, uh, World Wide Web Consortium. Um, you can read through this. There's a little more. Think of it as kind of uh, triples, right? So um, a thing has a relationship to a thing, right? Um, here's an example you can look through that kind of explains that. So the basic one-liner is instead of creating a web of documents, like on the Internet, um, have a web of data. So there's certain things, like this picture that I took, that was at a place. That place could be the Sheraton San Diego. Am I giving enough plugs for EDW here, Shannon? Uh, you still have time to register. Um, but there was also an event at that place, right? So again, there's common narrative. So it's just adding some context to things like web pages. So coming up for air, that we're done with the race through technologies. And this is actual picture from somebody who's ever listened to one of my presentations. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> that, that may have made your head spin. But hopefully if you're interested in any of those, it's enough you can go back and kind of look through. But what's equally or perhaps more interesting is not only what type of metadata we need to store, and that's only going to increase, but then how can we use some of these technical innovations to manage metadata itself, the meta, 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 metadata, right? Um, and that's changing a lot too. So one of the things that everyone has heard about now is machine learning. And how can that be applied to lineage or metadata. So in that picture, oh, can I show it one more time or do you have it memorized? Um, in, in that picture that we showed before um, of, of that kind of typical data lineage, um, certain parts of that can be automated. And, and if anyone's been in the business as long as I have, you should have done that. So does customer link to cust on the database? And is TBL underscore CL link to customer, right? So a lot of that in the past was sort of done by, and still, there's still a use case for that, kind of manual mapping. That I know SSN equals field one, SSN equals social security number, and you can create these naming rules and do matching, and there's still a very valid place for that. But for a lot of that boring stuff, kind of like this teacher was saying, you know, not, none of us really join data management to do a lot of those mappings. Um, so a lot of those can be pattern maps through things like machine learning. So if you set up this thing, this pattern looks like a social security number, you can go through the data and find that for you. So, hey, this field X looks a lot like a social security number, is it? So some of these things that are just kind of that banal, boring mapping that we don't want to have to do, that's a great use for a machine. Um, and so a lot of this lineage and mapping can just be sort of done on steroids. Um, it still can be a place for naming rules and mapping rules. And, and some I, I almost... Um, align it to, you know, sometimes I can get frustrating that every search nowadays is kind of that Google style search that, you know, show me everything to do with fish on the internet. Well, that's fine. But often I want to say, show me a file from last week at three o'clock written by Donna about fish with, you know, you want to get more specific. That seems, you know, there's still a place for that kind of thing and, and define mapping as well. Um, both can learn, uh, both can exist. An, another nice uh, way for metadata, in the, in the news year, several years ago, metadata was suddenly you know, the hot thing of folks who were sort of taking cell phones and, and doing metadata pattern analysis. And, and so I heard some folks in our industry say, that's not metadata. Well, that's not metadata like relational database metadata, but it's certainly metadata. Um, it's just used in a different way. So think of things like fraud detection or threat detection or you know, understanding um, 
a terrorist organization and who's talking to whom. That's done by kind of pattern and graph database analysis. One of my favorite quotes, and I didn't save it, I'm kicking myself, a friend of mine from Australia, um, they were having a similar to folks in the U.S. who might be remember some of those metadata, um, you know, people were looking at metadata from phone calls and things like that, and was that valid, was that creepy, was it whatever. Um, and there was a headline in an Australian newspaper that said, Prime Minister offended by not being invited to metadata talks. <laughs> like, yes, my career has come full circle. That That is a headline that the Prime Minister wanted to get in a meeting and talk about metadata. Um, because metadata was critical to some very key business definitions and, and actually government rules. So, again, metadata means a lot of different things. Um, and then this idea of just tagging, and, and what's sort of nice to see is that, you know, everyone gets metadata. So you, not that Amazon S3 is a totally new technology at this point, but it's not a relational database, right? So um, they have this idea of things like metadata tags that can actually travel with the data. So you want to say, I want to have this a security tag on this bucket or on this file, and it, as you move it, it'll stay with it, which is pretty neat. Um, so you can assign that metadata with your kind of put and post requests. Um, as well as some of the system generated metadata they have, you know, is what kind of storage class, when was it created, um, you know, what encryption levels, et cetera. That's that who, what, where, why, when of metadata. So what's sort of nice is, is that, you know, most platforms get this, that w with metadata, um, I have this, I've created a test bucket, you know, GDS test bucket. What, what is that? How long do we have to retain it? What does it mean? That's what makes it interesting. Um, so, yeah, we could, again, wax poetic about all the different technology types, but to summarize, any technology, any data needs metadata. So how do you design a metadata strategy that makes sense? There's so many different types out there. There's so many different stakeholders now looking at the data. It can make your head spin. So um, I'm a consultant. I'm a big fan of templates, right? They kind of make our log job easier. And all of these, you could sort of say, well, duh, that's sort of simple. But it's the simplicity of them that makes them helpful. So one, one thing that's helpful is just do an inventory of all of your data sources, right? What do we have? And this, I know this slide is hard to read. Do we have relational databases? Do we have BI tools? Do we have open data sets we need to look at? Do we have a big data platform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And you may want to do something like a stakeholder matrix. Who is looking at that and why? Um, and then almost do a mapping. So here we'll see in this example, SQL Server, oh no, it was Oracle, is used by everybody. Um, that might be good to make sure we have good metadata about that. These open data sets, huh, a lot of folks are using these. I hope we have good definitions for what this open data means and, and all of that. So it's just kind of a nice uh, heat map of priorities. What tech do we have and who's using what? Um, and I also often do a racy and, you know, how important are these people? Is it one kid doing one little analysis or is it the CEO trying to find some information and and hate to be elitist, but that does make a difference, right? <laughs> so CEOs looking at it, make sure they've got a good uh, information for them. Um, and, and I talked about this before, but I, I'm, it's important enough to mention again, is don't overdo it and don't underdo it. So know what to manage closely and what to leave alone. So yes, I'm doing a, a master data effort. Please, yes, that needs to be highly governed. There should be clear metadata around it. Um, core enterprise data, my enterprise data warehouse, yes, please have lineage, please have defined metadata, defined metrics for the reports. But then if I'm doing some raw exploratory data, I, I want to do some sentiment analysis from the last media campaign, um, marketing campaign, and I'm going to download some data sets and see what happens. Don't limit folks from doing that sort of exploratory analysis. Um, and then there's this kind of gray, or actually it's light blue <laughs> area in between, is that there, you know, maybe there's some local data marts or some local reporting that people are using or operational reports. There should be some um, governance there. It doesn't have to be an entire enterprise steering committee to approve everything. Um, but there's often a continuum, right? Things that may have started out as exploratory data. Oh, that's something we should maybe track in the warehouse. Didn't realize that the weather that day uh, for a media campaign affects sales. Let's part, start tracking that and, and vet that in the warehouse, et cetera. Um, but just don't overdo it and don't under, underdo it. Really give some thought of why, how this data is being used. So that's metadata, right? <laughs> that how this data is being used. And then put together a realistic roadmap, right? So 
the challenge for all of this, there's so many things we need to do. We need to have a realistic business strategy and how that relates. There's things like Internet of Things and open data and social media and my, my data warehouse and everyone wants to look at it. We'll do that analysis that we showed before of what and where and how, but do think of the why. And, and it may take a year or two to really get that full metadata lineage, but can we do sort of quick wins? So if we started with just customer data, how many people would be happy by that? Marketing would love it. Sales would love it. Customer support would love it. The execs, of course, would love that. So let's start with customer as sort of a business area. And then, yes, we could do a data warehouse and phased approach and do customers first. But then we don't want to just be old school. Can we think of the new stuff too? Could we look at from social media around customer? Can we communicate that out? Can we have a governance look at customer first? Right. So just think of it holistically. And again, not brain surgery, but important to think about where you are today in terms of maturity and what your business priorities are, and then deliver these things in a, a phased quick win. So uh, to summarize, um, metadata is hotter than ever. Why? Because more people realize how valuable data is. And if you get that right and support both business and technical and both kind of the new technology and the old, I mean, you can't skip any of it, that's really where you get that faster time to light bulb, right? The reason we're doing this is better innovation, faster speed to, speed to market, and reducing risk, right? So um, we'll quickly open it up for questions, just a few things. Uh, we do this for a living. If you need help, let me know. Uh, the oops, the um, white papers I mentioned are all available both on data diversity as well as our global data strategy uh, white paper. Um, if you're passionate about metadata, it is Education Month, and there is a course out on metadata management um, on the Dataversity website if you're interested in that. It's just a short, it goes into a little more detail than we covered today, um, and we hope you can join us next month to talk about graph databases. So with that, Shannon, we can open it up to questions. Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. Um, we've got questions coming in already. If you, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, we will be sending a copy of the presentation by end of day Monday for this uh, webinar with links to slides, links to the recording. Um, so diving right in, Donna, you know, common practices a common practice uses tools such as Kleba to build out data catalogs, business glossaries, and data dictionaries. What is the best way you have found to tie all these out, and how do you think the documentation um, to a well-documented database, ex for example, um, extension props? Um, I am seeing kind of a, a merging of of the two extremes in the market. I'm going to. I'm. You wanted me to bring out my favorite picture of the lineage, so I'm going to go back there. Um, so I, I think in in the old days, or you know, typically there's almost been an either or. There's been a tool that's been really good at sort of getting the technical side, and that might be your standard metadata repository or your data modeling tool um, that kind of have scanners and can automatically populate your data dictionary. Where those historically have been weak is really getting that idea of a glossary. What is this, t and, and having a view that the business people can have. So then there's been often tools, um, and I, won't, I don't like to mention names, but that have had more of that, you mentioned Kleber, but they've had a very good um, kind of business user interface. What, what does this data mean? What are my glossary terms? What is the organizational structure around that? But I think historically there's been kind of a gap between those two. You sort of had an either or. I don't think we're 100% there yet that any one tool in the marketplace solves all of it, but I'm seeing an emergence um, that a lot of those data modeling and metadata repository tools are moving more towards to adding more glossary functionality and more organizational structure and more collaboration and that business usury start. And I think a lot of the business usury tools um, are realizing that it, you can't have that in a vacuum and they're adding, um, they're adding some of that technical stuff so that you have the glossary definition. So hopefully this line here will go away and it will be solid and you'll have all. So I th it, right now, there's kind of strengths and weaknesses, but holistically, you need to see them both together. So I hope that helped. Absolutely, and I'm kind of sorting through the, the chat as well. There's a lot of great questions that came in through there. You know, with all the changes going at the speed of light, wonder, um, wouldn't it be a nightmare to document all this stuff? It's, are there any automated tools available? 
Um, yes, there's definitely automation. Um, so there's two answers to several answers to that. One is don't do it all, right? So pick w just enough metadata management. So you know, I would definitely start make sure your master and reference data and core enterprise is documented. So that's like on the type. I think the other way to prioritize and not boil the ocean, as they say, is on the um, the content. You know, maybe we're going to start with customer data first or product data first. So type, content, and then there's certain things that are automated and certain things that cannot be. So a lot of this, can you want me to show the picture again? Uh, a lot of this picture can be automated. Plenty of tools out there can scan your relational databases and get the data dictionary. What can never really be automated, and it will scare me when it can be, is what's in human brains, right? So you can automate a lot of the stuff that can be automated with machine learning or scanners, um, and then there's that that makes the human analysis easier. Um, and there should be a way to connect both of those. Is you can only define how you define total sales. No one can define that for you, but the tools can help you with a lineage to show how that was calculated, if that helps. So yeah, don't do it all. Automate where you can, and make that automation let you have that faster time to light bulb to really do the business side of it. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of questions about tooling here. You know, is, is there any way to use machine learning to help um, that's used to help in uh, metadata repository information to automate this and enhance it? Yes, yeah, so I did touch on that briefly. So some of this can be done, I wouldn't call it machine learning, it's really learn, scanning the ETL and scanning the metadata catalogs. There is a lot of the metadata tools are adding that idea of machine learning so that you don't have to say, a, you know, this particular field maps to this is one example. And they can sort of depend, there's a lot of metadata is patterns and that's what machine learning is really good at. So yes, definitely use that. So, you, so humans don't have to do this machine stuff. <laughs> humans can start adding the human metadata on top. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, and in general, Donna, you know, how much of the metadata management process should be on paper, quote unquote, on paper, so to speak, before using um, tools, you know, such as glossaries creation and extracting technical metadata from the source for future validating? Um, I, I'm a, I am a, a bigot to have things automated and, and on machine wherever you can. That said, I'm also a big fan of whiteboarding. And let me give you an example from the slide. So this example of the of the data model, right? A lot of folks want to skip data model because it takes too long. And I will, good thing I'm I'm not with you. I would slap you for that, right? So it does not have, so something like this is a great way to whiteboard. Get some business people in there. What data do we even have? Staff, salespeople. I did this last week at a education client, and it was a light bulb moment for a lot of people. Someone said, "We have donor information, we have IT information, we could link together," and it was literally a brainstorming of all the data we have and how we can use that better. Um, with, and that, but that then that should be put in a data modeling tool with true metadata. Then they did do the scanning for the relational databases. So it, it's it's both. Use the technology where you can. You shouldn't have a person going writing down data dictionary fields from a database. Please don't do that. There's tools that can do that for you. Um, but using pen and paper where it makes sense to brainstorm and then put that in the system also makes sense. So both. So how do you manage the many versions of the metadata as business usage is complex and it means different things for different business units? Mm. Good point. So especially, well, with versioning for the technical, you definitely want to say, you know, this was, you know, test, you should, you should version your metadata repository if you have that. Do a test, development, production, just like that worried database, because it, it actually is. Um, for your technical metadata, make sure you map that. Am I doing, as you do change management for your production environment, metadata should go through that. But I think more importantly, and probably what the person was saying, I think it makes sense with these collaboration tools. At a minimum, um, who changed, uh, I'm trying to find that slide. I guess I'm a consultant, I can't talk without slides. Um, <laughs> but this idea of the Wikipedia encyclopedia, or who made the changes, it really is that balance. So in some cases you can have discussion and then the steering committee must approve it, but at least you see where that change came from with discussion. Or it could be open collaboration, but at least you can say this was changed because of these past. So most of these do come with some sort of history and discussion threading and things like that. So does, you know, does the data governance um, steering committee actually do collection of metadata or just put some strategy in place? Um, 
I think generally uh, the steering the, – there, uh, there's a slide I could show that shows that. Um, the governance is on many levels. It's kind of an operational level. You know, the architects day-to-day, -day, they're the ones actually building that metadata. Um, I wouldn't say that the steering committee would be doing that. With the steering committee, to the person's point, is they, they should vet that decision. So say you are using a collaboration tool and two, two groups can't agree on what total sales is. That's a great way for the steering committee to kind of make that final decision of what it should be done. So no, I, I would think there's either a working group or you know kind of the operational teams generating the metadata, but it should be easily consumed by that steering committee so they can, almost that idea of that data model I showed, they wouldn't build that data model, um, but it would be a great tool for the steering committee to say, how do we prioritize these? Should we have a program to link loyalty with customers? That kind of thing. So they, this should be consumed for them to easily make those decisions. All righty, and I'll give everyone a moment to add additional questions here. We, um, uh, there is a question here, Donna, if there's templates for you that you can share. Uh, we, of course, will be sharing the slides. Yeah, we will share the slides. Um, they're kind of little on here. Um, I, we don't share templates beyond that. I will say that the course um, that we called out does have a few, goes into a bit more detail there. Um, you can kind of get the idea. But, you know, these are, quote, templates, but they're also easy to build yourself. That's kind of the beauty of them. It's a spreadsheet or it's a document. Um, so. I love it. All righty. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of the questions here. Donna, thank you so much for another great uh, presentation. It's such a hot topic and such an important topic. Um, it's clear by the questions and by uh, the attendees. So uh, just a reminder, we will be, uh, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides, links to the recording. And uh, also we have, I hope everyone will join us in April for the rise of the graph database. Um, Donna, and yes, you did an amazing job promoting EDW. I just loved it. It was awesome. So hopefully we'll see everybody in San Diego next month as well. So I hope everyone has a great day and enjoy. Thanks, Donna. Thank you.